the Iris Network um, is a private agency based here in Portland, Maine. Um, many of you may have uh, heard of it before as the, the Maine Center for the Blind before it changed, changed its name a few years ago. It is uh, a service provider that's been around for over 100 years serving clients throughout the state of Maine. There are um, six different services that the, cent that the agency provides. I'm just briefly going to uh, mention them before we get to talk about the, the rehab center, which is what we're all here for today. Um, our oldest service that we have uh, that's currently still running is our community vision rehab therapy services. We contract with our partner, the Division for the Blind uh, and Visually Impaired in the state of Maine, to provide VRT services throughout the state. We have 11 VRTs who work in the communities uh, all through the states. And you probably have met some of them. Some of them are here today um, at the table as well and out, been working hard organizing this, uh, this conference too. Another service we provide is a low vision clinic. Our low vision clinic is about 10 years old. It is um, manned by ophthalmologist, optometrist, and an OT who may be in this room today. Is Sherry here today? No, not yet, okay. Uh, Sherry is an OT and a CLVT as well. And that um, <coughs> service is provided to, um, to folks mostly from the southern Maine community, and uh, we do take Medicare um, funding as well through that service. We have another service that um, many of you would be familiar with uh, because probably you've um, come across similar ones in your community, and that is assistive technology and employment. We provide services, again, throughout the community as well as on-site at our facilities. And we work with people uh, individually uh, on their job site, adapting the job site, and we work with employers as well. And we've gone as far away as uh, Virginia from here. Um, and you'll hear about that service a little bit later as well. Another service that we provide that is kind of unique and frankly quite innovative, um, and that is uh, supported living services for clients who otherwise would not be able to live independently. So we're all about independence. We all want full reintegration into the community. But sometimes due to uh, secondary disabilities that may be more challenging. So this service provides support for folks who have those secondary uh, disabilities just to get them over that barrier to reach their maximum independence. It is a, um, a large partnership project uh, of which we are a minority holder, but a significant one because we are the service provider <laughs> for this population. Um, we have a 30 unit apartment building on the property that is low income housing and um, more than half, about two thirds of the um, residents in that building fall under the category of uh, people who would receive services from us because of their visual impairment and therefore they're able to live independently. And that service, for those of you who are from out of state, that service is available for, um, for uh, applicants from out of state as well. Uh, Another recent project that we partnered with the Division for the Blind on uh, last year is uh, concerning dual disabilities, uh, sensory disabilities. As many of you know, uh, Usher syndrome is quite common in the French Canadian population. You know, there are two pockets in the country where that is quite common, one in Louisiana and one is up here in Maine. And the numbers can be um, as high up as in the thousands of people with Usher syndrome or dual sensory disability. The majority of them are senior citizens um, who otherwise we probably will not hear from because of other health concerns they have. But we did partner with the Division for the Blind trying to get a count on uh, who's who, what's what, and who needs what kind of services um, 
and we're trying to figure out how we can serve that population best. Last but not least is the rehab center. We're going to be hearing today from um, all the folks you see in front of you here. It's a big group. <laughs> They're going to tell us the story from start to uh, finish. Unfortunately, the finish was going to be Pauline, who was going to give us her perspective on going through the center and how that assisted her in her rehabilitation. Um, the rehab center is just over a year old, um, 14 months old actually, since we opened up. And we have had clients from within Maine and out of state as well uh, so far. And things are going pretty well. You know, there are growing pains. We all go through that. But uh, so far, uh, so good. It's been a really creative um, project to be involved with in a lot of ways. Um, we all have been hearing about the WIOA or the WIOA regulations. We've all been hearing about the pre-employment transition services and all that's bringing up uh, in our fields and it's, it's been quite a dominant subject or both of these actually in the field. We're very involved in that as well. This is a, a private public um, joint venture that, that uh, the Iris Network Rehab Center is all about. Um, and we are uh, fully aware of how critical it is for all of us in the field, not just um, individually, to uh, figure out a way to improve the employment um, rates in, in the community. And this is a, another option that we're adding to the, uh, to the offerings that we can provide our clients. So I'm going to turn the mic over to my, our first speaker here. First speaker is Brad Strauss. Brad is somebody who can talk about the subject from many angles. <laughs> uh, he has been a consumer of a rehab center. He uh, then changed careers um, and became a vision rehab therapist and a rehab counselor. Um, and when, when this project was being discussed, Brad was the chairman of the State Rehab Council for the Division for the Blind in the state of Maine. So Brad's role in the process was critical in uh, shaping up what the idea is and how to go about it from there. So I'm going to turn over the mic to Brad. Brad? Okay. I'm going to stand up um, just so I'm thinking my voice might carry a little better. If I start to mumble or anything, please throw something at me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I can't, uh, so, well, now we have a rehab and center in Maine, and I'm really, really excited about that, uh, primarily because I'm a product of a rehab center myself. 25 years ago when I uh, began seriously losing my, my vision back in Michigan, after floundering around for a year or two, I finally got connected with rehabs, uh, the blindness rehab services in Maine, I mean in Michigan, and, uh, and not doing so well with that until I got to the rehab center and spent three months there. Um, living, eating, breathing, blindness, uh, blindness uh, skills acquisition, living and talking with others who are sharing my experience and living and talking 24-7 with um, staff members and other successful blind people. So I was not only acquiring the skills that I needed, but I was b being able to uh, necessarily apply them, you know, on a continuing uh, prolonged basis. And I was able to see that uh, there were plenty of blind people around me who were successful, were happy, were leaving leading full and meaningful lives, which uh, uh, just hugely accelerated my acceptance of blindness and my adjustment to it. Uh, so having had that experience, uh, it, it's, it's difficult for me to overstate the value and the benefits of, of a rehab center experience. Uh, I think probably, as most of you know, if, if if you talk to almost anybody who has had that experience, they'll, they'll say pretty much the same thing. So when uh, I came to Maine here to, to practice, uh, actually initially 20, 25 years ago, there, there was a, a center in Maine, 
but as the services went in different directions, that center dissolved and went away and, and there was no longer one for the past, I don't know, 15 or 20 years. So uh, I always wished, um, uh, among others, those who, who shared the, this experience and knew the value of it, shared the wish that uh, we could have one in Maine. I think because of that, you know, we all kind of, or several of us kind of kept our eye open, consciously or unconsciously, for any kind of opportunity to perhaps do that someday. Back in 2010, because of some issues uh, in the blindness services arena uh, in Maine here, the legislature uh, requested that a report, a study be conducted about the uh, current and future state of blindness services in Maine uh, be conducted and then a, uh, a report produced. Um, that took about a year and it was a, a it was a very intense, very comprehensive undertaking that included, it was interdisciplinary, uh, interagency, included some uh, consumer representation, uh, a very, very broad look at, and in-depth look at uh, the state of um, the blindness services in Maine and what was coming up in the future and what the needs might be. So that report was finally completed and turned over to the legislature. One of the primary um, conclusions in that report, and this will be no great news to most of you folks, is that the, the itinerant model was not and, and probably would not be able to keep up with the growing demand out there. You know, uh, shrinking staff, uh, growing caseloads because of the growing incidence of blindness, and, and also the extensive traveling, time needed for traveling, especially in a rural state like Maine, uh, was overwhelming the, uh, the itinerant program and the itinerant teachers. Are there some itinerant teachers in the room here, in you know O&M folks? You know what I'm saying. Uh, so it, it was, you know, it was, it was pretty obvious that we needed some alternatives unless we could just freely hire as many <laughs> teachers as we needed, which well, of course wasn't going to happen. We needed some alternatives. And one of the major alternatives uh, that was examined in a, uh, in, uh, was a rehab center. And it was pretty much uh, a consensus that a rehab center would be a great resource to have in Maine here. Then a few years after that, this would be three or four years ago, uh, uh, an opportunity began to arise for an, a grant from the RSA that would help begin to create a center. Uh, there were, a grant became available that would pay for remodeling the IRIS network here uh, in order to provide the facilities and the infrastructure to house uh, a, that would be needed to have an uh, a center-based program. We pursued that for probably two or three years, I think three years, uh, and again that was an interdisciplinary and interagency, that, that was quite a, a collegiate effort uh, that included the SRC strongly. Um, so we did a lot of campaigning for that together and uh, finally made the application and made a good one because we, we did win the uh, the grant was close to a million dollars. Immediately began uh, construction here at the IRIS network uh, to help build, to begin to build those facilities. Also, the IRIS network uh, came up with some private funding. They did a major uh, fundraising efforts of their own, and and came close to matching that million dollars. So uh, everybody's pretty pretty heavily invested in this. Um, so we. As the facilities were being built and as they neared their completion, we uh, realized, well, we need to, of course, we realized all along, but it was time to put together a curriculum, a program, uh, mission, goals, objectives, all of those things. So DBVI, that's the Division for Blindness and Visual Impairment here in Maine. Rather than saying 19 syllables, I'll just say DBVI, if you don't mind. So. Um, the DBVI and the IRIS network put together a really inclusive, comprehensive committee. It was actually quite large uh, of people to start to 
develop and create uh, the orientation and the curriculum uh, for the center, you know, uh, policies and programs, and uh, it was, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, way bigger than, than uh, what we <laughs> at first realized. But we managed to do that, I guess that took, we did that for a year, probably, uh, close to it. Uh, uh, it was very intense, very intensive, we met in subcommittees and uh, put something together uh, good enough to begin at the opening last year, last fall, uh, we started the first class here, uh, and we've been having it evolve uh, ever since. So it was a it was a it, it was a very huge undertaking. It was exciting because we were going to have something. We've got the resource um, with all the potential, all the inherent benefits and value and all the potential uh, benefits and value. Um, it was a great partnership uh, between, primarily between the uh, uh, IRIS network and DBVI with the SRC and the consumers playing a large part as well. Um, all of that input I think was necessary to try to get something that was going to satisfy both the the agencies and the program, as well as uh, create something that was uh, uh, very effective for consumers. I think is now we're we're limited to five minutes, and Rabia here is quite a taskmaster. I don't dare <laughs> make him mad at me. You know. The other thing too was that right towards the end of that, I got to say this was because uh, we we realized we had a tiger by the tail. There was a lot of detail. And uh, Rabia here became available. So right uh, towards uh, the end of this endeavor with, with planning it, we were able to uh, take advantage of Rabia's 16 years of experience as the Director of Services at the Carroll Center. So uh, that, that was a huge help. Am I time up? Yeah, okay. <laughs> you want it back? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. So uh, the, the thing that, that is important for us to mention here is that uh, this is but one option of rehab uh, service delivery. And uh, community services is an integral part of the rehabilitation process, even for those who go through uh, rehab center training. Um, rehab center training is more like a college Think of somebody going to an undergrad for intensive four years, getting it all at once. But there's always education before and after that four years. And um, this is a, a similar model to that. Um, I'm going to present our next speaker here, um, Tim Heinemann from the state of New Hampshire that many of you are familiar with. Um, Tim has been around for quite a long time with a lot of experience in the field. And uh, it was great to partner with Tim early on to develop an understanding about the, the potential uh, benefit of this center to, um, to folks outside the state of Maine as, uh, as well as within the state of Maine. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Tim. Hello, everybody. Um, in this time when we all discuss how meager our resources are and opportunities are to um, meet our, uh, and opportunities are and how our profession and community need more than we currently have, there's this brand new resource um, adding value to our field. Um, it exudes a refreshing confidence in vision rehab. The bold and exciting Iris Network Rehab Center has arrived in New England. Um, as any AER's employment division chair, I congratulate the professionals and consumers in the great state of Maine for um, their thoughtful process in bringing this center to life. Through a partnership between public and private sectors, the federal RSA, the state of Maine um, Division for Blind and Visually Impaired, and the IRIS Network, they're showing us how working together in our common need, we can truly succeed in creating opportunities uh, to meet our needs. Um, the IRIS Network is orchestrated to uh, provide many options uh, with, uh, to both professionals and consumers alike 
with the available services of, of rehab training, uh, voc um, rehab counseling, vision services, O&M, medical assistance, ophthalmologists, occupational therapy and employment, and tech specialists. So often um, when something's new on the horizon, uh, we can feel threatened by it or um, that this newcomer on the, on the horizon is a competitor to our mission. But I'd like to celebrate it as a fresh perspective and resource that we can all improve <coughs> in, uh, that we can all use and improve in providing um, well-rounded and re relevant rehab services. My experience already in working with the Rehab Center is that it's a flexible and comprehensive resource eager to listen and open to trying new approaches um, to meet my clients' needs and my personal needs as a rehab specialist. I find that they are truly manifesting their motto, which is rehabilitation is a mindset and not a skill set. Thank you, Tim. Um, so the next speaker here we have is another Tim. Uh, one of the things that I I'm not sure if that was clearly said early on in the, in the presentations, that this really is a VR program, strictly a VR program. This is for vocational rehabilitation. Uh, obviously, we'd love to serve the entire community, but the funding for this from the get-go, the drive behind it came from the SRC, from RSA, uh, through VR uh, services, and therefore our focus is um, primarily and at this time exclusively on vocational rehabilitation. And to that end, uh, we asked one of our partners from the State of Maine Division for the Blind, Tim Small, who is a vocational rehab counselor in the Lewiston area in Maine, to uh, discuss uh, what uh, the center is like to be used as a, as a tool in his arsenal of vocational rehab services. So Tim? Good morning, I'm Tim Small from DBVI, I'll keep the acronyms as well. Um, so I've been asked to talk about who might be um, an appropriate candidate um, for referral. Um, and so there, we don't even have enough time to discuss all the um, people who might be appropriate, but um, the shortened version um, would be those clients who have had a sudden loss of vision, um, who um, really are overwhelmed. Um, in the state of Maine, they're most likely rural and isolated. Um, and so services coming to them uh, would not necessarily give them the skills that they need to maintain themselves on a daily basis. And if they're not able to do that, then you need to look at that they're most likely not going to be able to work. Um, and our focus obviously is on employability. And so we have those people that may be, have had sudden vision loss or have had a decrease um, had, that had already had a vision loss but have had more of a vision loss and the skills that they, the skill set that they did use or had um, is no longer adequate, that they need to be updated um, and have those skills um, really brought to a level um, where they are able to maintain themselves at home. We are looking at potential young individuals who we all know, um, if anyone has worked with transition-aged um, students, they are sometimes resistant to services um, and once they graduate all of a sudden the expectation is that they're going to be working or going to school and they may not have the skills to be able to do that and so all of a sudden there is a big shock and this program really condenses um, the learning for them so that they can really move on um, and be prepared in a shorter period of time um, for employment um, or potentially college, uh, depending on what that goal is. For me, I have found the clients that I have been referring uh, have multiple um, 
disabilities and challenges and that in the comfort of their own home and on paper everything really looks good it looks like they've had training um, it seems like their skills are really good but they're still not getting jobs and so those individuals that I have sent to the center really have, we've been able to uncover that there are some other underlying barriers that meeting with them at home um, didn't really uncover and they were able to be addressed um, at the center um, either through counseling um, or whether it was ADLs um, so that when they got back home they were able to engage in services in a much more productive way um, and hence increasing the potential for their employment outcome. Um, the program itself, I've been asked to kind of give a little overview, is an intensive 40 hours a week, um, so that's five days a week. Um, we're looking at 10 hours of AT. We have four hours of vocational development a week. Two of those hours are scheduled as a group um, workshop assessment time. So during that time, we're looking at um, transferable skills, um, looking at the different assessments to determine um, interests, abilities. We are also meeting with clients for two hours um, for individual vote counseling to further discuss those assessments and to discuss how they are actually doing at the center um, because initially my clients are typically pretty overwhelmed um, and I would say by week three and four um, they have really started to buy in um, by week 12 they would like to live there so um, and so I think looking at um, the travel distance for most of us in the state of Maine even as a VR counselor um, it's nothing for my region for me to travel three and a half hours one way to see a client um, so having clients that are center-based um, make them much more accessible um, and it's a better use of our time and I think personally um, I enjoy working in a group model um, and having direct contact with the individuals that are working with my clients at the center and being able to sit down and have a conversation with them about what they're seeing um, is very different than receiving a phone message or an email. Um, you're really able to have a clear, good communication. Um, and I really think it comes down to good treatment. Um, and Rabia, have I gone over my five? Or am I doing okay? No, okay, fine. see, this is what happens when you practice. So, um, so looking also um, what I have found from the clients that I have referred, the isolation piece by being in a group of peers, whether they're the same age or not, um, living with them. Uh, I've had clients come out saying, wow, like there actually is hope that there is a possibility for me because look at this person they had a job they lost their vision they're here because they need to learn these new skills and my vision is, is better than theirs and I'm thinking I couldn't even work and look they were doing this job and I think just the sharing piece um, is very powerful and it's very powerful even for the young people that might be considering attending for the simple fact a lot of my students are the only student in their school that is visually impaired so they feel like they are the only ones in the entire world um, that has a visual impairment 
Um, and their parents feel very much the same way, that my son or daughter um, is the only one um, and I'm the only one to experience this. And part of that is I think they tend to do a lot for their transition aid students. Um, not that they aren't phenomenal parents, but I think we can overparent maybe. And by taking them out of that really comfortable um, home environment, individuals that say, oh, I have these skills. I, my orientation mobility is great. I can make it to the mailbox. I know how to get around the mall. Um, it's very different. Um, when they go someplace that they're not familiar with, perhaps with staff that they're not familiar with. And what I find is they come back much more confident um, and much more self-reliant. And that feeling does um, lead itself to a better work outcome. When someone can go into an employer confidently, um, is able to maneuver the environment, um, is able to be prepared for an interview, being able to be comfortable discussing um, their vision, and being able to discuss what they may need for accommodations. Um, those sorts of skills and abilities are really w what is going to convince an employer um, that they do have the skills and the abilities um, to be a good employee. Uh, you know, this is a good beginning for the, the meat of the, of the program here. Um, the rehab counseling is the critical part of getting the client oriented to uh, the, the goal of the program and focus on returning to work. And um, it's one thing to get them thinking in that direction, but you need to also give them some tools to give them confidence and they can perform the tasks to be independent personally, uh, which would then give them the confidence to move on to present themselves to an employer as a potential contributing member of the workforce. So we're going to talk next about um, the actual uh, skill development areas uh, that clients go through uh, in the program, keeping in mind that the likelihood is and should be that client, the average client who goes to the rehab center should have received some skill development services from low vision therapy to um, uh, vision rehab therapy and O&M and uh, even some counseling uh, before getting into um, kind of the highway speed of a rehab center that's more intensive and, and, uh, and comprehensive um, week after week after week. So we're going to start talking about the skill development at this time. I'm going to introduce Amber Mooney. Amber is, um, plays a couple roles at the rehab center right now. She is partly a case manager and partly a vision rehab therapist. Uh, she's been with us for a couple years at the agency, and she is um, one of the people who provides the, 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 but is under the umbrella of vision rehab therapy. Um, so we're gonna uh, group them together for the sake of time today, but that's not to uh, undermine or underestimate how critical each and every one of these uh, disciplines uh, is in the vocational development of a client. So Amber? So I am here to talk about the center and we're talking about the process that goes into all the center. And as Rabia just mentioned, a big part of the center is the skill development, whether it be initial skill development or more adaptations. Um, at the center we have experienced certified staff in VRTs in a number of different skill areas, subject areas, um, so we cover it all. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the whole VRT perspective and all those subject areas and how it all works together hand in hand really. Uh, and of course we start with an assessment of the client and their skill sets, uh, evaluate their state and their functioning as far as accessing uh, printed material, reading, writing, uh, and the accessible technology that they have available to them. Uh, as well as activities of daily living type skills, uh, cooking and cleaning. Uh, staff determines um, the amount of training that is needed you know, for our transition age students. That may more 
be the skill, actual development of the skill, whereas with our adults uh, who are just newly acquiring, they're going to need more the adaptations, they already have the skill. Um, and so we also look at the state of functional vision for each client and what the prognosis is. If they still have vision, we're going to use that uh, and look at how it best meets what they are looking for. Each plan is obviously very individualized according to what the client needs and has. Um, clients will learn to understand and articulate their vision, their functional vision, so they can advocate effectively for their disability needs. Um, clients looking going back to work, work need to be able to voice what accessible media means to them and what they have available in kind of their arsenal or toolbox, if you will. And as we are all very much aware, clients have to be prepared today with a whole host of tools, whether it be technology or other accessible media. Um, and especially if the diagnosis is progressive, the tools they're using today might not be the same ones they're going to use later on in the road, but they do have to know how to utilize those skills or technology later on and where to acquire or access them, whether it be low tech, such as our handheld magnifiers or reading braille, or whether it's the higher tech stuff, such as your braille displays, Victor Reader streams, tablets, smartphones, CCTVs, and so on. Um, clients are trained daily on how to manage their appointments, their schedules, be able to take notes efficient, efficiently and effectively, and like I said before, identify and define that accessible media to be able to read and write. And we also have to have backup systems because we all are very much aware of the technology will fail, malfunction, break when we need it most. Um, so let's see. All right. So they'll learn daily life tasks such as accessing printed material, accessing their mail, how they're going to pay their bills and how they're going to do job searches, whether it be on the computer with the screen reader or if it's easier to use a tablet, how are they going to uh, work on their resume? Are they going to use a braille display to edit word by word or are they going to use a CCTV to spot check or maybe some combination of all of these tools combined? Uh, as a, any of the RT knows, there can be many tools for each specific little task. Clients also will learn how to organize their workspace efficiently because not everyone's going to be at a desk and behind a computer. Um, they could be working with knives, they could be working with table saws. Those, so they have to learn to be able to <coughs> manage and organize all of that in an area and do so safely. And we do do that training. So whether it be setting up your stapler and your braille display or your table saw hammers and screwdrivers. Uh, we do provide training for all of the above. Um, so in order to be ready for work, you also need those ADLs in place. Clients have to be able to identify the colors of their clothing so they match. They have to be prepared with clean clothing because if they are going out in public as a person who is blind or visually impaired, they need to be confident in who they are and how they're presenting themselves because otherwise they're not going to be confident in an interview in front of an employer. So they also learn to prepare meals. Uh, so that's planning for meals, shopping for your food, cooking, uh, cutting, and also the labeling piece. Labeling your foods hand in hand goes with also labeling medications, which is especially important today for those 
with secondary, whether it be diagnoses, disabilities, having to manage medication and food like those with diabetes is crucial because it's not only labeling your medications, it's learning how to be able to refill your prescriptions, keep your doctor's appointments, and so forth and so on. So, as we've talked about a little bit here, we have the itinerant approach and the center-based approach. And I'll just reiterate what's been said already. Um, it is, can the three months, 40 hours a week, it's co very comprehensive and intensive. Uh, skills in one area overlap with skills in another area. I might teach braille labeling with the Dymo labeler in one class. Another class I teach how to do the talking label wand for audio labeling. Then they go to the activities of daily living class and in that class they're working with another VNT on labeling their food. So now they have a different couple different options. Or they might be wiping down a table, cleaning it off in ADLs, and they go to the manual arts area and they're learning how to paint. Or with O and M, sweeping an area with your cane. So it all works extremely hand in hand, which as Tim was saying, to be able to have those connections is just phenomenal to be able to change your plan day by day, hour by hour, either push that client forward, or maybe it's time you see that you need to pull back, the client is overwhelmed. Um, so to be able to have that at your hands as a provider is absolutely phenomenal. So this is just you know a small um, blurb on the whole VRT process that goes into it. Uh, but it is absolutely essential and integral to the rehabilitation process. Um, we say it's a mindset, but that mindset and skill set really work hand in hand. You can't have one without the other for that successful outcome. And so when they leave, we have taught the client how to be not only independent at home, community, and work, but how to be independent going forward so they can get what they need, um, whether independently or out in the community, they know how to get it. All right, so uh, I'm gonna present the next two speakers who did not wanna talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> forewarned, and I'm sure they're gonna be quite short. <laughs> So we're gonna go with, uh, the first one is um, another skill development that's critical, and many of you would recognize why, and that is O&M. I'm gonna ask Mike to take the mic, Mike. So uh, when, I, when I was, um, I, I've been at the Irish Network for about a year now, and um, uh, it's my first O&M job, so I'm relatively new to the field, and when I was considering places um, to try and look for a job, and I found out about, <clears throat> first of all, I was interested in coming up to Portland, I'm from Connecticut, and, um, you know, I, so I, uh, I came up for an interview, and um, Rabia told me about what was going on. I really didn't know that much about what they had planned. And um, when he talked to me about what they were planning and, and uh, the idea that I could get in on something, you know, that was so exciting and new from the ground up was really important to me. And uh, so, um, and after a year, it's, it hasn't been a disappointment. I've been very happy with it. But um, so... Uh, Basically, you know, I, I'm an O&M specialist, so uh, we all know how important travel is to be able to get where you want to go. Um, and uh, what we do, what I do generally is when we get a new client, uh, the first, we have two buildings. We have the dorm where they live, and we have the Ryan building, which is where their classes are. And they're about a half mile apart. So, you know, the first thing we do is do an orientation of those two buildings, you know, including the fire escapes, you know, safety first. Um, and... You know, once they get that down, then we start to work on other skills. It's also, you know, the first two weeks uh, is generally an assessment period for everybody. So, um, you know, it's a good time to assess, you know, cane skills in an indoor environment. Just, you know, basic orientation also to see if they have any um, physical limitations that might, you know, hinder their ability to do certain things, whether it's um, stamina or just, you know, the ability to ambulatory type stuff. But... Um, uh, you know, I, I did my internship with um, uh, Besby in Connecticut, which, is, um, which was an itinerant model. And, you know, I thought it was a great experience. Um, you know, so I guess my only professional work experience is with is center-based, but um, I had enough 
of an experience with the itinerant model to compare the two. And, you know, from what I found is that uh, the teachers I worked with are great, but they just don't have the time to spend with people that, you know, we have here. Like, like Tim and Amber said, it's 40 hours a week, you know, and it's treated, it's treated like, like it's a job. Like they're going to work every day pretty much. So, um, you know, and I think it's, it's so much easier to break down each task and work with someone. Some, some people struggle with certain tasks more than others. Some people are, um, have had O&M before. Some, some have had very little. Um, but I found that, you know, a lot of the ones that have had O&M, uh, you know, some of the younger kids that are, well, young adults, I should say, um, they've had O&M in the past, but uh, they haven't done any independent travel. So the fact that, you know, one of the things we, one of the goals that we have is for them to be able to walk the half mile between the dorm and the Ryan building. So for a lot of them, that's the first independent travel that they've really ever done. And, um, and it's, you know, certainly not because I'm a better teacher than any of their other past teachers, but, um, you know, it's just, like I said, it's the time you're able to spend and it's their skill development, it's their the ability to practice the skills that they're learning that they generally don't have the ability to do, uh, I think, with the itinerant model a lot. And um, so, um, uh, let me see, like here. And uh, also the team model. The team model I find extremely beneficial, especially being someone that's fairly new to the field. You know, we have, we have meetings every morning where, um, you know, we basically talk about the day before. And um, it's a good time to get an idea of, you know, hey, how, how this person did in this class and or, you know, versus your class or anybody else's class. And, and like, for example, you know, it's great to be able to bounce things off of people that are working in the other domains. Um, and uh, I found that very beneficial, especially like low vision, you know, hey, why don't you try this device, you know, today or these, these shades, you know, this might help, you know, st stuff that I you know, am learning, but somebody knows more about than I do. And I, I found that extremely beneficial. Um, we've had uh, a couple dog guide users, um, mostly cane users, but a couple have come in without canes that really should be using canes. And, uh, you know, some people are resistant depending on, you know, I think the younger, the younger um, uh, clients tend to be a little bit more resistant to that if they don't have canes. But, all of them have left using canes. You know, you're able to, I've, I've been lucky to be able to convey the importance of, for some people, of using the cane, both from identity purposes and for safety. Uh, and I think, you know, that's, that's been a, a very you know, big step for some of the younger uh, clients that, um, that we're, you know, I think we all know that a lot of the younger folks don't want to use a cane. And um, so that's been something when they're in it, they see other people, there's other examples of people that, um, didn't have canes, but now they're using them. And I think we have an open enrollment. So we have people that come in in the beginning and they're there with people that have been there for eight weeks. So they're seeing where they're going to be in, you know, after they have a chance to work at things. But um, so, um, you know, and I think uh, the collaboration with DVBI, I, I found it very beneficial with, um, like Tim was saying, um, it's, it's great to be able to have him and, and the other VR counselors come and be in on the meetings. and. And, um, you know, it's, I think it all benefits the clients, and um, I think that's what we're trying to do. So um, I think I'm, hey, Mike, I think Mike, I'm done. One sure. Hey, this is Brad over here. Absolutely. The, uh, do you find that there's an opportunity uh, with the students and uh, being here in Portland in the city to uh, have some experience with uh, how to use public transportation? You know, yeah, how can get comfortable with all of that? get familiar with that we do you do bus travel is a you know and, and the other public transportation op options that they have uh, being in a city it's a lot different a lot of people that are from Maine that come down or a, a good portion of them are from very rural areas so there really isn't much opportunity for public transportation there might be some you know paratransit options but um, you know we do a lot of we do do a lot of focus on bus travel uh, we had one student from Connecticut that took the bus home to uh, actually was picked up and brought home, but took the bus from Connecticut back to Portland, and um, she stopped in Boston, did the transfer, and that was her first uh, foray into that uh, type of thing. So that was a big accomplishment. And like I say, it's like you know, it's all about um, providing opportunity. You know, you want to challenge people, but you want to.
provide opportunities for success because I think you know that success is where that confidence is built and where people are starting to realize okay I can do this and I can you know I can take charge of my life and be responsible for my own independence and and uh, you know making things happen so my name is Bonnie Guzzi I'm the director of access technology and employment services at the iris network and I'm here to talk about access technology um, so what is access technology um, access technology is all the different methods someone uses to gain um, access to information on particular devices or software. These can range from computers to tablets, smartphones, video magnifiers, software, applications, um, text-to-speech, and that's just to name a few. So that there's a whole array of devices that people need. Some of these devices are now coming with the access technology um, embedded right in them. For example, the Apple has VoiceOver, which is their screen reader um, software. They also have Zoom, which is their screen magnification. Android devices, smart, smartphones and tablets now have TalkBack, and they also have screen magnification built right in. Um, there are also digital assistants now, like Siri, uh, Cortana, and um, Ask Google. With all these devices, technology has become increasingly critical to learn and to know, to keep pace with today's communication styles and employment opportunities. Um, in our comprehensive rehab center access technology program, we start with a review of all the students' current technology, what they're using, and what, the, what are the features that they know and use on a daily basis. Um, this is a demonstration process of show me. It's not asking them questions and they just saying, yes, I know how to do that. It's show me, demonstrate it. Um, some students may need to start at the very beginning, um, learning how to even just turn on a device or learn the keyboard. Others know the device, their devices for just what they need to use it for. And then we also have advanced users that come to the center. Um, this assessment also, t also tells us how effective the device is for what their, their needs are. Um, depending on the student's needs, we focus the training on the specific technology to maximize the benefit of, benefit of their time during their training at um, the rehab center. Um, the main goal is to be sure the students are up and running with the basic functions so that they can access email, a calendar, the internet, and word processing. We want everybody to leave with those basic skills. Um, additional devices and software options are identified and added as the student progresses through the program and their individual plan develops. Um, although the main focus of our training is on computers, students are introduced to a variety of other devices and machines. For example, we have the Merlin Elite. You can put a piece of paper underneath that it's uh, take a picture, it processes it, and within um, 10 seconds it's reading a newspaper article to you um, or a book. So that's um, a really fun machine. Um, however, there is no machine yet that can read handwriting. So we're still hoping that people can work on that and still someday have that um, available. Students are also able to put their hands on braille displays and put the braille that they're learning to use. Um, a braille display is both an input and an output device, so you're typing in braille and you're reading in braille. Um, devices also include note takers, um, from a simple recorder to more technical. Um, each student is provided a talking book player to use at the center and also if they want to take it back to the dorm with them. They are also given um, the cartridge and cable for, to take home with them and they um, have blogs and um, podcasts and they can download from the internet so they do take the cartridge and ca cable right home with them. Um, we also have um, some students that come from more intensive training. They already have a specific device or app or software that they want to learn um, and these students can come for a one day six to seven hour session then other students can choose to come for a week-long, one-on-one, or small group training. And again, we always start with a basic assessment um, to learn their level, 
and also to identify the training goals that they want to um, leave with. Um, in our center, you will see students working on assigned computers or devices with a training sitting close by providing the instruction. The environment is set up like a business and industry with cubicles, each having a computer with the most effective access technology for that student. Um, This setting also allows for um, a student to identify the accommodations that they may t need to ask for in a workplace, whether it be um, glare um, or lighting, mobility, um, or a braille display to access their job. What I really appreciate, about, appreciate is the style of the trainers, John, Kelly, John Allen and Steve Kelly. Um, they stay current with the ever-changing technology trends in devices. They are outstanding instructors, and, but they don't always provide instruction. It's encouragement. It's the confidence and instilling confidence in the student and knowing where that student is currently. They have this uncanny ability to know when to challenge the person or when to step back and say they're becoming overwhelmed and lighten it up a little bit with humor. Um, they're just outstanding um, instructors. And um, they're active listeners. They accept the students at their level. Their mindset is always, you will get this. We just don't know how right now, but we will figure it out. Um, no trainer of access technology can know it all. But John and Steve will find the answer, and they are honest enough to say, I don't know the answer to that. Let me find out, and I'll get back to you. And they always do. We also have David Sear, our IT person who is outstanding. And as Amber said, we always have technology glitches, uh, something always comes up. And he is there in a heartbeat figuring it out and taking care of all our computer problems. Um, they also write exceptional case notes. Um, anyone can read the notes and learn the goal of the session, what the student mastered, or what they may need to still work on which is really, really helpful if somebody needs to step in. And that usually is me. If somebody needs is a sick day or whatever, I'm available to be the pitch hitter. Um, and finally, we help them build their technology toolkit. Everybody needs to know how to begin the troubleshooting process, but also when to call for help, where the most effective help is. Um, and we like the students to graduate um, having resources in their back pocket. As um, access technology changes, their world changes, they get a job, um, their vision changes, they need to know who to call um, to get the answers that they're looking for. Um, the access technology and employment services piece of the IRIS network um, also provides technical assistance to small businesses as well as large multinational corporations nationwide. Um, at times, job coaching support is necessary to learn the access technology, how it interfaces with the company's specific um, program. And um, this job coaching can be um, short term, can be long term. And as things change, um, the job coaching may need to be reintroduced and can be reintroduced. Um, it's a great pleasure doing what we do. We all love working at the Iris Network and, and in the Rehab Center. And um, I just want to thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Bonnie. Bonnie is quite, quite modest, actually. You should see her doing some scripting discussions. She's uh, quite good at it. And with these big companies, as she mentioned, TD Bank and, and AAA are a couple of the most big companies she talked about. Uh, so we've heard a lot about the skill development. We've heard a lot about the, the infrastructure of uh, the services and the center itself. And, you know, it, it's like uh, telling somebody who just got two leg prosthesis, you know, these work great, they're fantastic, they're, you know, they, they, they're electronic, they could do everything but make you coffee. <laughs> You know, and they are, um, you know, cutting edge technology and a lot of support and, and you're going to tell them, okay, now stand up and walk. Uh, you know, and that's where the mindset is critical. You know, that person may have been convinced by Tim that he needs to go to work and, and by Amber that, you know, whatever she teaches him is going to help, help him on daily basis. But 
you know, it's a big step to take to, to be convinced that, okay, I have the confidence to get up and, and, and walk on my prosthesis. And uh, in some ways, it's similar to it. So um, the adjustment piece, the, the mindset of the, of the client um, to kind of get into that, uh, s that uh, um, I don't know what you want to call it, orientation, I guess, um, of life is, is the next speaker uh, for us here. Um, just a word about that before I turn the mic to Sue Allen. Uh, Sue Allen is, a, is a, uh, an, our mental health therapist at, at the center, or has been up to now. She's moving on to other jobs um, somewhere else, but I'm glad to uh, catch up with her before she leaves here. Um, we can do it all ourselves, and at times it's good to look at uh, partners in the community to, to leverage our resources. You know, Tim Heinemann mentioned that earlier. Uh, at, at kind of at a field uh, level, but um, we can also look at it at a community-based level. Um, Sue Allen works at Sweetser, which uh, is a company that employs about seven, eight hundred mental health therapists statewide. It's a it's a big provider in the state, and it had been a um, great pleasure for us for the last year to partner with Sweetser to provide the mental health therapy and to work with, with Sue Allen to get her up to, to speed on what it is that uh, visual impairment and vision loss and blindness um, is like and, and the counseling part of it is like. And she's done a great job with that. And uh, her uh, successor, who started with us actually last week, uh, seems to be following her footsteps. Uh, so we look forward to continuing that relationship. So I'm going to turn over the mic to Sue Allen. Uh, thank you. So as Rubio was saying, my name is Sue Ellen Worley. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker, um, which makes me a little bit of an odd duck with the rest of the folks um, that are sitting up here. But um, when I started um, just over a year ago, so 14 months ago, I did start with the first group um, it was a very eye-opening experience, experience for me, um, for someone who was coming from more uh, a, um, a very different frame of reference of, of working with folks. Um, I just remember Robia, you know, kept kept telling me, "No, you have 12 weeks. Y you only have 12 weeks." I'm like, "No, no, 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 no. No, it that doesn't make sense. No, you got to do it all in 12 weeks. You, you can do it. Okay." Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> no problem. Um, so the, the learning curve for me was, um, was a little steep, but it is, is definitely been um, the most rewarding job I've had in the, in the 20 years that I've been in the mental health field. Um, at, um, with folks that, that come into the program, um, you know, folks come in from all different um, backgrounds. Um, as a couple of folks have already said, most of the, the students that come in have come from very um, rural um, environments, um, which means that they come to the center with, um, you know, tremendous feelings of isolation. Um, and with that, there, there tends to be a lot of um, depression, a lot of anxiety. Um, most of them have been um, living with some family member. Some of them have been living independently. Um, one of the um, additional pieces that, that we get to do because we are center-based is we actually do on occasion get to bring some of those families in. Um, so when you're working with folks in the community, people are living at home, you know, they've created these world for themselves that, that work. Um, and, you know, you come back week after week and they, you know, it just doesn't feel like they've been progressing. Well, it might be because they have that really well-meaning family member that have been doing all of those things for them. So you're not seeing that that independent growth that you would like to, which tends to be a little frustrating as a, you know, other type of practitioner. What do you mean you're not getting it? Come on, we talked about this four weeks in a row. Um, at the center, we can see um, what it is that's happening and we can see um, what those adaptations are, whether they're working, whether they're not working. And then, you know, all the other presenters get to figure out those ways um, to help them really learn it. Um, so as Rabia was saying, so the, the mindset of folks coming in, um, you know, whether it's that the overwhelming depression or anxiety, you know, we really as a team get to look at those things um, and say, you know, this, this part is a barrier. 
um, and let's work as a team to be able to address it. Um, the other speakers tend to look at me um, to say, okay, you need to fix that little bit of anxiety because it's keeping the person from um, being able to walk down the stairs independently or it's keeping the person from um, just a couple weeks ago picking up the saw in, um, um, you know, while working with John, the client was trying to make a box. She had been told her entire life that the saw was going to hurt her. And she was absolutely convinced that it was going to jump off, off the table and, and hurt her in some kind of way. And, and to be able to step back and really work with John to work through with this client um, was amazing. So being able to pick out what it is, those little nuggets that are getting in the way um, is amazing. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Um, and that you just don't have the luxury of, of that intensity of work and that collaboration of work when you're working in the in the field by yourself. Um, so I, I apologize. That was a little bit convoluted, but the you know two major points of that that team effort, um, being able to really look at what those barriers are, what that mindset is that's getting in the way, um, and then also helping them for when they go back, moving from. Um, being a recipient of services to someone that can access those services. So whether it's with their VRC of this is what I need or no, that isn't what I need, um, or with their families, this is what I need, this is not what I need, or with their employer, um, you know, it, it just, um, it goes a long way. So, so can you say a word about the peer support that they get from each other? Sure. You can mention that with me, but can you expand on that? Sure. Um, so um, I do provide um, two different um, interventions at the at the program. Um, so I do meet individually with um, most of the f um, students that come through during that two week assessment period. Um, I am assessing as, as well. So figuring out if there are, um, you know, really some of those adjustment issues that are getting in the way or some of the mental health issues that are getting in the way. Um, and then we also do um, an hour of group. Um, so it is a peer support model. Um, uh, most of the um, groups, I have um, allowed the students to pick the, the topic. Um, so we've spent um, quite a number of sessions talking about their canes. Um, as Mike was mentioning, um, you know, young and um, some of the older students have a lot of feelings about their canes. Um, a lot of feelings about independent travel, a lot, a lot of feelings about, um, you know, being a um, living in a sighted world and what that means and the stigmas and um, other barriers. Um, so most of the time I will let them drive those conversations. Um, there have been a couple of groups where um, the other instructors have brought up topics that were really salient during the week um, that I posted them and did a little bit more of a structured group. Um, but the peer model has been just amazing because everybody's in a slightly different place in their growth and development. So, you know, being able to hear somebody say, um, you know, I'm, I'm really nervous about this and, you know, I'm really nervous about traveling on the bus and this is what, what was scary for me and somebody else going, are you kidding? I just came from Connecticut. Like, let me tell you all the successes that I just had. And, you know, watching the energy build in the room um, around those successes are, is pretty uh -huh. powerful. I have seen rehabilitation from both sides. I had a 30 year career um, as a certified rehab counselor with Division for the Blind in Maine. And now I'm the vocational specialist in the Iris Network's Rehabilitation Center. I see a few familiar faces from my time as a rehab counselor, so I'm glad you sat in on this session. Um, the rehab counselor role in our field is critical, um, and I enjoyed every minute of it. However, I had limited time to spend with each consumer, and it was always around the key points of eligibility, intake, planning, and closure. Thinking back, I probably spent maybe 12 hours, uh, maybe 14 hours with people during the course of their entire VR program, barely scratching the surface of who this person was and what their real goals might be. As the vocational specialist in the rehab center, I'm having a ball and I provide vocational development to the out-of-state referrals. I am scheduled for four hours of direct service per week with each referral so during the course of a 12-week program, I have 48 hours with each referral for vocational exploration, 
job shadows, informational interviews, resume writing, lining up references, all of the things that go into becoming, uh, uh, looking for a job. But that's only part of it. The observation possibilities in an immersion program are endless. I see the consumer interacting with other staff, other consumers, cab drivers, job fair recruiters. I have the benefit of seeing the consumer through the eyes of other professionals, often a completely different view from my own. It is this difference in view as the individual succeeds with a street crossing, prepares a grilled cheese sandwich, sands a piece of wood in manual arts, that is what causes me to shift gears and search for the same moment in the vocational area. I know you have it in you. It's my job to help you find it in your job search. It is an important mind shift for me as part of the staff in the immersion program. Do not allow myself to be limited in my expectations and watch for growth and change. The Rehabilitation Center is a culture of change. Staff plans change in a heartbeat as the consumer grows emotionally and in skills. Training is adjusted to build a better foundation. What you see initially is no, certainly not what you get 12 weeks later. Our presentation title is Center-Based Rehabilitation, a Mindset, Not Just a Skill Set. And I have to tell you, I had some trouble getting my own mind around that. What is the staff mindset in the rehab center? Staff mindset number one. Whatever the consumer is attempting is doable. It's up to us to figure out how. A young woman um, told me at our first meeting that her goal was to be a software developer on the Apple Access team. However, each time she said the word Apple, she giggled and hid her face. On the final days of her program, she conducted one of the most professional informational interviews I have seen with a senior specialist of the Apple Professional Learning Center who's a member of the Access team. Bonnie had the connection to the Apple Access team, but this young woman earned the right to that interview and she nailed it. Staff mindset number two. We are a team, not a collection of specialists. Nobody has all the answers and we learn from and support each other. One young man arrived at the rehab center wedded to his laptop. No interest at all in exploring portable note-taking devices. This resistance went on for a few weeks and then the University of Southern Maine had a career fair with a couple of employers that he really wanted to meet. Steve Kelly, one of our tech instructors, and I helped him prepare for the noise and crowds of a good career fair asking him how he intended to record information while trying to balance his laptop. He thought about it and the morning of the career fair asked if we could bring some portable devices for him to try. Off we went. Steve assisting him with recording information first on an iPad then on an iPhone while I assisted him by identifying the next business and directing him toward the recruiter. We had quite a day. <laughs> Staff mindset number three. We have unquestionable faith in the rehabilitation process. We will find a way, and we are excited about overcoming obstacles. A man from away arrived with a clear plan, returned to a familiar job, and live with or near his mother and grandmother. However, he's a true foodie, and he quickly fell in love with Portland's wonderful restaurants. <laughs> He also started to acquire some pretty decent technology skills. He shadowed a call center position at Maine Medical Center in the food services department, taking calls from patients with their food requests for the day. He loved it. The seed has been planted, a move to Portland and an application for a call center position at Maine Medical Center might just be in his future. That is the staff mindset in a center-based model. Whatever the consumer is attempting is doable. We are a team, not a collection of specialists, and we have unquestionable faith in the rehabilitation process. The rehab center is comprehensive, intensive, and multidisciplinary, offering daily contact between staff and consumers. It is the staff mindset that creates the culture where rehabilitation can take place.
All right, thank you, Susan. So uh, I guess just to wrap this up, you know, we can't obviously uh, say everything that um, has been going on for, what, six years now from what Brad had mentioned when the idea came up and they started developing this concept up till now where the, the center is operational and with all the staff that work in it.